Look, may I beg you not to develop intellectual fatigue on this issue of energy policy? Nothing currently is more critical. Yet the issue is divisive, riddled with contradictions and, may I say, ignorance. Politicians who should know better give every indication, as I spelt out to you last night, and you can read that on my Facebook page today, Alan Jones Australia, evidence that they've never read anything. The origins of all these conferences, by the way, this is the 26th about to take place in Glasgow. If we get intellectual fatigue, and if you trust my judgments, the future for our kids is grim. Remember some of that stuff I talked about last night where the man regarded as the founder, the godfather of this climate change stuff, Morris Strong, said in 1992, we may get to the point where the only way of saving the world will be for industrialised civilization to collapse. Isn't it our responsibility to bring this about? Unquote. The mournful news is that is precisely, precisely where conferences like Glasgow are heading. It's called COP26, the 26th time we've had these talk fests. They'll keep going, I guess, until they get their way. I quoted last night the Emeritus Professor of Ecology at the University of Santa Barbara, Daniel Botkin, who said in 2007 in a Wall Street Journal article, and I quote, the only way to get our society to truly change is to frighten people at the possibility of catastrophe. Well, that's why they keep wheeling out this 18-year-old Greta Thunberg, mocking people like Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron at a Youth for Climate conference in Milan. And she goes unchallenged. It is a metaphor for how absurd the world is. I suspect her knowledge of the issue is nil. But it's part of the frightened people at the possibility of catastrophe agenda. I mentioned last night Otmar Edenhofer, a UN Intergovernmental Panel climate change official, who said in 2010, quote, basically, it's a big mistake to discuss climate policy separate from major themes of globalisation. The climate summit in Cancun, that was in 2010 in Mexico, at the end of the month, is not a climate conference, he said one of the largest economic conferences since the Second World War. He said, one has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. This is about wealth transformation. Unquote. Well, you've often heard it called the Great Reset. Well, now the lefties and the ideological misfits are applying the weights to Scott Morrison. There was a report in Europe this week that he may not attend COP26, as he has, quote, things to focus on domestically, unquote. And they accused him of being in hiding and embarrassed by Australia's approach to climate change. Well, I can assure those critics that the majority of Australians will be cheering from the rafters if Scott Morrison stays at home. Mr Morrison has told the West Australian newspaper, and I quote, it is another trip overseas and I've spent a lot of time in quarantine. I have to focus on things here. And with COVID, Australia will be opening up around that time. There'll be a lot of issues to manage and I have to manage those competing demands, unquote. I read that as shorthand for I won't be going. But if Anthony Albanese wants to brand the Prime Minister as being embarrassed by Australia's position, and if the Greens leader wants to accuse the Prime Minister of being in hiding, do your best. You took all this rubbish to the last election and lost the unlosable election. Mr Morrison is looking crook at the polls, but he only has to say he'll embrace an energy policy which provides energy for our homes, our industries and our businesses, which is available, reliable and affordable, and we won't be intimidated from using all our energy resources, coal, gas, nuclear and renewables. He should say that only a mug would put our energy needs in the hands of the weather. He would win an election. Before I talk to Matt Canavan, who makes sense about this, and his sense is backed by scholarship, may I just share with you a bit of amusement at the mess Boris Johnson has got himself into? He's got a 270-page flagship environmental bill with dozens of new commitments before the House of Commons. But now... Sufficient members of the British Parliament are waking up that this is unlikely to be passed before Boris starts lecturing people in Glasgow. And can you believe it would have to go to the House of Lords who would have to agree to amendments, one of which would force ministers to declare a climate emergency, which is a key demand of Extinction Rebellion. From America's point of view, you've got their climate envoy, John Kerry, flying around the world, not rowing a boat, private planes emitting carbon dioxide, and trying to convince the Chinese to come to the party. China's simply saying, while it merrily builds hundreds of coal-fired power stations, that China won't be playing ball with Boris or Joe Biden. China will use climate targets as bargaining chips for access to US markets. Well, Matt Canavan is a rare politician of courage and conviction. As you know, he's a senator. He's only 40, lives in Yapoon in Queensland. He's got a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Bachelor of Economics with honours. He's worked at the Productivity Commission as a senior research economist and later a director. He then became a senior executive at KPMG and he's been prepared to confront this issue. 
What does all of this mean, though, for our kids as well as our country? And he joins me. Senator Canavan, thank you for your time. I mean, th could I just say, you're out there in the middle of nowhere up in North Queensland. This could be the shortest interview ever because didn't the Prime Minister on the 25th of February 2019 say in a speech that Labor's 45% emissions reduction target could cost 336,000 jobs. Has anyone modelled what a 100% cut net zero would cost? Matt? Well, not in Australia, not that I've seen in Australia, uh, Alan. I'm not in the middle of nowhere. I'm uh, here at a cane field uh, just outside of Mackay. And uh, it's places like this that would be hit hard. Uh, by that sort of emission reduction cut. Those, uh, that that modelling you mentioned, I, I made the same comments during the election campaign last uh, year. That modelling was done by a very eminent economist, Dr Brian Fisher, used to head up the Agricultural Economic uh, Agency, ABARES, in Australia. Uh, he ran the figures. Uh, you're absolutely right. He found a massive impact on the economy. Uh, he, he, he estimated that a 45% emissions reduction cut would increase wholesale electricity prices by 58%. So the cane well, farmers here behind I'll just me stop you there. I'll just, uh, I'll just pump stop their you there. water up. Matt, 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 I'll just stop you there while you're talking because I just want to put that while you speak, this extra, extract from the speech of the Prime Minister, put this up on the screen. This was made in 2019, two years ago, and the Prime Minister quoted, as you heard Matt say, BA Economics, along with the, the Business Council of Australia. There it is. And it says, now the work shows that compared to our government's targets, Labor's 45% reckless target and 50% reckless RET, renewable energy target, will. Here he said, cost the economy an additional $472 billion. He said, I'm not kidding, $472 billion, almost half a trillion dollars. It said it'll slash more than 336,000 jobs. He said it'll cut the average wage from what it would otherwise be by over 9,000 a year. He said that makes the carbon tax look like a mosquito bite. He said this thing is a chunk out of the people's living wages. It'll increase wholesale electricity prices by more than 58%. He said that's not a sensible target. It's a reckless target. And it'll come at a tremendous cost to Australians. Now, Matt, having said all of that only two years ago, how on earth can the Prime Minister now start contemplating 100% reductions? Well, some, some, uh, some Liberal colleagues are contemplating that, Alan, and it is absolutely absurd uh, that two years ago we'd go to the election, get a mandate from people saying that, hey, if you were to cut emissions by 50% or 45%, if you were to cut them in half, it would put a wrecking ball through the economy, cost hundreds of thousands of jobs and put up your electricity bills. We get elected on that mandate. And then two years later, say, hey, by the way, you know what we told you about that 50% cut? We're actually going to double it and we're going to make it a 100% cut. And uh, no, don't ask to see any figures. It's all going to be OK. Just trust us. Trust, trust a uh, politician. That's all you need to do. Uh, there's been no modelling that I've seen done. None of the advocates I've seen out there for net zero emissions or harsh emission reduction cuts have put forward the figures to the Australian people and say, this is what it is going to cost you. Uh, and if you don't know what something is going to cost, don't buy it. You don't buy a house unless you know the price. You wouldn't buy your groceries unless you knew the price. If you don't know the cost of it, don't buy it. And if you did know the cost of net zero emissions, you definitely wouldn't be buying it because it is astronomical. Absolutely. Just looking at Britain, we only go to Britain last week. They demonised coal. Last week they had to fire up a condemned 55-year-old coal-fired power plant to meet the power demands. I mean, there was nothing unusual about last week in Britain, warm weather, high electricity demand, but the central component of British energy policy, which has absorbed tens of billions of pounds in public investment, failed. And this is the rubbish they're wanting to take to Glasgow. There are 11,000 onshore and offshore wind turbines in the UK supposed to deliver over 20% of electricity supplies. Last week, 1.9%. Matt, can't we learn from that? Well, uh, Alan, I think uh, having the climate conference uh, in Glasgow has been a stroke of genius because it is going to show everybody uh, exactly what not to do. Uh, exactly what you shouldn't do is go down this net zero emissions path, outsource your energy needs to other countries. Keep in mind, uh, for the last few decades, the UK has been an energy independent. They had the North Sea oil and gas fields. They haven't developed any new 
oil production facilities. They've banned shale gas. They've shut down their coal-fired power stations. As you say, they've put billions of pounds into wind energy, which is not working at the moment because it's weather-dependent. And then when they need some extra energy, they ask uh, nice Mr Vladimir Putin, please give us some more, sir. Now, he's not doing that right now. He's not increasing the flows of gas to Western Europe. And that is causing the UK to go back to the dark ages with queues for petrol, uh, even food not being available on, on the supermarket shelves. Uh, now, that's not the future we want in this country. We should want this country. We have no reason to not be energy independent. Uh, we have lots of gas. We have lots of coal. We have lots of uranium if we had the courage to use it. Uh, let's use the things that God has given us here so that we can remain independent as a nation and, and defend ourselves too if, if this conflict that our defence officials are warning about comes to fruition. Magnificent. Just one point before you go. I mean, this Tony Lodge, who has been an advisor to the British government for a long time, gave evidence uh, to the House of Commons Energy and Climate Change Select Committee last year. They are inquiring into Brexit because the Remain supporters wanted to know why leaving the EU could benefit energy policy. And he made the point that since 2006, European Union rules demanded a closure of a third of Britain's power stations, a closure of older nuclear power stations, and in Britain, the power supplies from these coal, oil and nuclear plants have not been replaced. I, we can't be going down that road, Matt. That's exactly right. And what's happened in Europe uh, over the past couple of weeks is carbon prices. They've got a carbon tax, but the carbon price has gone up massively to $100 a tonne uh, to, to help because people rush to try and go to coal and gas and buy permits they need to operate those facilities. And keep in mind that a net zero emissions policy here in Australia, the CSIRO did some modelling, it wasn't very detailed, but some modelling to suggest that to get to net zero emissions here in Australia, we'd need a carbon price of over $200 a tonne. So have a look at what, what's happening in Europe at the moment, mm -hmm. and it'll be double that in Australia if we were to go down this route. I mean, okay. why, Alan, would we make our, our, our system weather dependent uh, we're okay. facing these risks of, of China in our region. We, we, we cannot have a system where all China would need is a weather forecast to know when to have a go at us. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we can defend ourselves. Just a quick one before you go. There's about 75 people in the parliament on your side. That is the coalition. How many of those 75 agree with what you've just said? Well, mate, I don't know, Alan, but what I do know is that uh, people who join and, and, and rally to the uh, Liberal and National Party cause, they join the party because they believe in smaller government. They join the party because they don't want government planning and economy. I mean, this net zero emission stuff is just a massive Politburo to be placed in Canberra to plan everything in the economy, right? Because it's going to say you can only do this, you can't drive that type of car, you can't uh, run uh, your, your, uh, your, your factory on this type of power. And that's called, that's called communism, Alan. That's what communism is, when the government Good directs the means of production. You. And people who you. join the LNP don't like communism. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and there is this temptation at the moment Brilliant. because because some people think net zero emissions sounds good, it sounds like fairy floss, maybe we should just do it because we want to get elected again. Absolutely. But I believe we've got to stay true to our principles and values, Alan, or Good we will not win elections and win the trust of the Australian people over time. Good on you, Matt. It's great to talk to you. Thank you for your time. This is a massive battle. On behalf of our young people, as well as the economic future of the country, Senator Matt Canavan.